took us a while to catch that video of Tanner with a shovel on the ice there, but we, we finally got it. it been working on that one for a while. Okay, maybe not. Um, today we're talking about anxiety. And, uh, you know, a- anxiety is one of those things that it, it seems like everybody faces, and, and we recognize, everybody recognizes it's, it's a major deal, it's a big issue. Um, in, in fact, it, it's funny, you know, you can listen to different things that will tell you everybody deals with anxiety every single day in different ways, shapes, or forms. In fact, as, as we talked about this series, this was an idea we had thrown out, I don't know, a year ago, I think, or, or longer, and, and uh, as we were preparing to do it for, for this January, um, about a month ago, I'm listening to the radio, and I heard this commercial that, uh, for one, just made me just laugh a lot. I think I was in the vehicle by myself. Um, if anybody saw me, they were probably wondering what's going on with that guy. But I was so puzzled by what was said, I, I had to stop and leave myself a reminder on my phone because I'm like, oh, that's gold right there. That's going to show up in this message when we talk about anxiety because it was a, it was a commercial for a dentist's office. And uh, as, as they were talking about th- this, this reality of how amazing their dental office is, they said this, there are dental anxieties that you walk around with every day. And I stopped and I'm like, geez, I didn't even know it. Here all along, I've been walking around with dental anxieties every single day. Now for some of you, just the idea of dentist maybe gives you a little bit of anxiety. But for me, I just couldn't help but laugh. I'm like, really? Like This is like profound truth. Everyone every day walks around with dental anxieties. Anxieties. Now, I, I thought about calling uh, Dave Nuremberger and asking him if that was true, you know, and what his response would be with that as a dental hygienist, but uh, I don't know. I got a kick out of that. Maybe I'm the only one, but they went on to say how amazing their staff was and how when you come in, they're so gentle and so whatever, and I'm just like, wow, really? Everybody has dental anxieties every day. Well, I missed the name of the, the office, if you're wondering. Like, I was just so baffled by the statement, I totally just missed what the name of the office was or anything like that. But uh, in all seriousness, you know, anxiety is a major issue that a lot of people deal with. And, and, I, and I don't want to make too much light of it other than that conversation or that commercial, but because for some people, maybe even some of you, like, it's something that you battle with and you hate the reality that you deal with it. Maybe on a daily basis, maybe not so much with the dental issues until now, you didn't even know, but anxiety is a major issue in the U.S. Some statistics say that 40 million adults in the U.S., it's about 20%, deal with anxiety. As well, about 25% of teens in the United States deal with anxiety. Anxieties and all those numbers were prior to 2020, and you can probably guess that those numbers, with everything that came with 2020, caused those to probably skyrocket. Well, as we start this morning, I want to be clear, much like last week, that we're not addressing clinical issues within this series or diagnoses that require a deeper level of help. We're just handling some of these conversations and topics in gen in general and want to help point people to the reality that God's Word and and the truth of what it has to say about these things can be the antidote that we need to deal with some of these things in life. In fact, you know what? You, You think about it, you go to the doctor for a whole lot of different things and they might give you a prescription and they might tell you what to do and how often to take it and whatnot. Can we just recognize that this is the prescription that we need every single day in life? And here's the thing, you can't have too much of it. You can take it once a day, once a week, but I'm telling you, if you're in God's Word on a regular basis, you're going to recognize the power and authority that it has in your life. And that's what we want to point to in this series. Well, as we talk about anxiety, the lines can become quickly blurred between fear, concern, Uh, responsibility, some would even say, worry, they can become really blurred really quickly. In fact, a general uh, healthy concern, if not handled effectively, can turn to worry, anxiety, or even fear, 
Right? If we don't deal with something that comes up in our life the right way, it can turn into something much greater. A realistic fear can overcome us in a moment when our vehicle's sliding down the road and, and, and it's headed towards the ditch, right? And the result of that situation can vary in a number of ways. We can recognize where we were, and man, that's generally a, a, a sharp corner, and we probably ought to slow down next time we come to that corner. Probably a little bit of wisdom there, right? Probably just general wisdom. Or, or we could recognize, you know what, man, it's, it's time to get some new tires put on the vehicle, so we better call the mechanic and schedule to get some new tires put on the vehicle. Or, or we could take it to another level and say, you know what, I don't even want to ever drive in the snow again. Might need to move, okay, if that's the case, right? I don't, I don't want to have to drive in snow, so when it, so when it snows, I'm not going to drive. Or we might say, you know what, I'm never going to drive again. You see how we can take something that happens and we can turn it from a, a healthy general concern and maybe even being responsible to all of a sudden, if we're not careful, it can shift to worry or concern or, or even fear. By the way, if you're that person that goes and gets those tires, if they're still good shape, let me know, all right? Because I might buy them off you. Well, as we talk about anxiety, it doesn't help that we live in, in an age where worry and anxiety are all around us. One article had this to say. Waves of alarming headlines, social media posts, email updates, and stray thoughts threaten to throw us down a tailspin of trepidation. The what-ifs are endless. School shootings, cancer, unexplained illness, loss of loved ones, pandemic-related issues, financial ruin, violence, riots, raging storms, devastation and unrest, uh, contaminated drinking water, broken food chain supplies, nuclear war, global meltdowns, collapsed economies, and a thousand other worst-case scenarios. I hope that didn't create any anxiety in you. More than ever, we're flooded with information, and much of that information plays on our ungodly fears and anxieties, it can become a playground for Satan's targeted attacks against us. As we talk about anxiety, many times anxieties seen in the what ifs, right? That if we're honest, most times never happen. I mean, we work up all kinds of scenarios in our mind. Well, what if this happens? What if this takes place? Well, what if this? And we work up all these things and get ourselves so worked up about these what ifs that in all reality, most times never happen. C.S. Lewis, and they're studying mere Christianity in the next uh, service there in that class. I want to encourage you to check that out. I thought about skipping next service and checking it out myself, but I don't think that would work out. In C.S. Lewis' book, Screwtape Letters, which is written from the perspective of the enemy of Satan and his, and his demons trying to derail followers of Christ. Okay, so it's written kind of from that other perspective. It says this in that book. There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy. Really against God, right? He, being God, wants men to be concerned with what they do. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. There's endless scenarios, endless what-ifs that can control our lives if we're not careful. And if we fall into the trap of constantly thinking about what might happen, we're not going to put enough legitimate concern into what we really need to be doing. Well, this morning we're going to be addressing anxiety. It's, and we're going to jump around to a bunch of different passages, but primarily I want to spend some time in Philippians chapter 4. I love that text, and, and we're going to spend some time there. It's on page 571. But we're going to move all, all around a little bit, okay? So you're kind of going to have to just hang with me as, as we go through this. According to the Bible, Anxiety is a serious issue. It's a serious matter. Jesus commanded his disciples in Matthew chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. He said this, do not be anxious about your life, about what you're going to eat, where, about what you drink. Similarly, Paul wrote, do not be anxious about anything in Philippians chapter 4. These verses 
are not to, meant to be comforting advice along the lines of everything is going to be all right. Okay, And we talked about that last week. Just because we follow these patterns doesn't necessarily mean that it's all going to work out exactly like we think it should. But these are biblical commands. Don't be anxious about your life. Don't be anxious about anything. Jesus, the Apostle Paul, they give them as commands. And to break them, therefore, is sin. Now, before your mind starts to run too far, I want you to notice this. Scripture does not always present all anxiety as sinful. Maybe you didn't know that, but I want to take you through some passages. The Apostle Paul in his pastoral role experienced a certain kind of of proper or right anxiety. He wrote uh, to the Corinthians that in addition to a number of hardships that he faced throughout his ministry, he said this in 2 Corinthians 11, 28. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. The Greek word translated anxiety there, it's it's a noun form of the verb be anxious that we see in Philippians chapter 4. Yet Paul describes it to the Corinthians here, not as a sinful anxiety, but that he has a godly, loving concern. This, This word anxiety here has that idea of a godly, concern or of care in fact a lot of times that same word can be translated concern or care throughout scripture we see contrasting forms of anxiety one that is proper one that is right and another that is contrary to the lord's will in the new testament it uses the same greek words for both kinds of anxiety so it can be difficult to differentiate Paul uses the same word in Philippians 4. Jesus uses the same word in Matthew chapter 6. And Paul, when he writes in 1 Corinthians 12, uses the same word. 1 Corinthians 12, 25, that passage about the body of Christ, the church, and how it works together. He says this, that there may be no division in the body, that's the church, but that the members may have the same care for one another. It's that same word, that word care is the same word anxiety that we see Or anxious, be anxious in Philippians chapter 6 and in Matthew chapter 6. In a similar way, Paul commends Timothy to the church in Philippi. And he says this. He says, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. It's that idea of anxious. Same exact word. You know, most of our sinful anxieties are probably connected to proper concerns, healthy concerns. It's proper, it's right for you to do your job well. It's right to support your family, to care for your children, to fulfill the, the duties that God has given to you. We should be concerned with all those things and more. The question is, when did these proper concerns turn into sinful ones? And, and, I, and I read this question this week and I thought, you know what, that really nails it. When does godly care become godless worry? And that can be a fine line. And I wonder if times we excuse anxiety in the name of godly care or concern. When if we're really honest with ourselves, what's really going on deep down inside is that we're dealing with this issue of anxiety. We know the signs, right? Sweaty palms, pounding heart, the inability to relax or stay calm, the feelings of having a a big weight on our chest, loss of sleep, and a host of other symptoms. So when does godly care become godless anxiety or worry? Well, Let's start with Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, Jesus is at the home of Mary and Martha. Martha is busy serving the guests and is most likely preparing a meal. Mary, on the other hand, is sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to his teaching, and Martha gets upset and tells Jesus to tell Mary to help her out. And listen to what Jesus says. Luke chapter 10, verse 41. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Can, can we just recognize we are all Martha at times? 
okay? Like, I, I think we're, we're quick to kind of throw Martha under the bus a lot of times in, in the Gospels. But the reality is we're all Marthas at times. I don't know what your plans are for this afternoon, but my guess is if, if you're having people over to your house, you've already kind of been a little bit of a Martha getting ready. And, and we can get so caught up with things that in and of themselves aren't necessarily wrong, right? Might even be things that need to happen. But what happens here with, with Martha? I, I, I look at this like a sister situation or a sibling situation where one's like, are you kidding me? I'm doing all the other work and they're not doing anything. No, that's never happened in your house. Never happens in mine either. But there's kind of that response here. And, and Martha is anxious. She's troubled about many things. But one thing was necessary. One thing was important. And Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to his teaching. This is really, in a nutshell, where we can talk about sinful anxiety. It, it, it's the idea of being consumed by otherwise real concerns, um, but all the while really taking our eyes off of Jesus. In other words, sinful anxiety puts worldly cares and responsibilities ahead of Christ. They take first place and Christ takes second place. Charles Spurgeon wrote this of Martha. Her fault was not that she served. The condition of a servant well becomes every Christian, right? It's good to be a servant as a follower of Christ. Her fault was that she grew distracted with much serving. So she forgot Him and only remembered the service. The Greek, Greek word translated distract, distracted in verse 40 means to be pulled away from someone or something and to have our attention directed to something else. It also means, as one Greek dictionary puts it, to become quite busy and overburdened. And isn't that what it is? Isn't that what we do a lot of times to ourselves? Become overburdened with, with really the routine, regular things that we do in our lives. So as we talk about this idea of sinful anxiety, it's the idea and it's the result of being pulled away from Christ leading to carrying unnecessary burdens in life. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. And notice what Paul says here. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. The main theme throughout the book of Philippians is joy. Or to rejoice. And the word joy or rejoice in these four chapters in the book of Philippians are used repeatedly. In fact, I went through some of my notes. couldn't believe it's been 10 years since we went through the book of Philippians for those of you who were here 10 years ago. But we went through this book and we went through this passage verse by verse and, and I just want to just spend a couple of minutes here looking at this passage. As we talk about the idea of joy and rejoicing, anxiety robs us from that. It, it, it steals it, right? In fact, all of these things that we're talking about this month, whether it's discouragement whether it's anxiety this week, whether it's the topics to come, it, these different issues that we address, they rob the joy that we have in our lives. It steals that joy. It ruins it. And Paul begins this passage by saying, rejoice, not once, but twice. And he's about to address this, this issue of anxiety, which I really look at this passage. If I could point to one passage in the Bible that deals with anxiety, it's probably my favorite. It's this passage, Philippians chapter 4. And I don't think it's any coincidence that he's about to address anxiety, and he's talking about rejoicing here. The idea of rejoicing, no matter what the circumstances are, rejoicing in the Lord notice. You know what, when we're followers of Jesus, we, we always have a reason to rejoice, if nothing else, for our salvation in Christ. We have reason to rejoice. And then he says this, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. That word reasonableness, it's 
looked at a couple of different ways, but it means this. Appropriate gentleness, patience, or graciousness. So in other words, before we even address anxiety here in this text, Paul says this, joy and gentleness are great combatants to anxiety. He's setting the table with joy and gentleness and then addresses anxiety in the next, the very next verse. This is probably my, my favorite set of verses on this, some that I've memorized, some that I quote time and time again. But notice that prayer is the antidote to anxiety. It begins with joy in the Lord. It's accompanied by gentleness. And, and can we stop and think about that? When we think about gentleness and anxiety, when we are anxious, we're anything but gentle and patient, Right? No, we're nerved up, we're worked up, we're, we're yeah, right? And Paul sets the stage with this, and what he's going to do here is he's going to give us these commands in regards to anxiety, but, but I want you to catch this. You know, I think too often we look at commands as I have to. Well, I got to do this. It's commanded, so we have to. We don't have a choice. I have to do this. I look at these commands as encouraging commands. It's like, listen, let me encourage you here to do this. This, this is just such a huge help as you deal with this issue of anxiety. And really, the command is going to lead away from anxiety, and it's going to lead towards peace. And really, isn't that what we want when we deal with anxiety? We want peace. Peace. We don't want to be anxious about what's going on. We're frustrated. We're working. We want to take that deep breath and we want to have peace. Listen to what this passage says. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't, don't be anxious about anything, okay? Okay? And, and can we just recognize there's this reality that as you study these things throughout Scripture, whether it's fear, whether it's worry, whether it's anxiety, the Bible addresses these issues because the Lord knows that we're going to face them. All right, these things are going to come. We're going to have to deal with them constantly in life. So there's, there's this reality of here's how we face them. Here's what we do when we come upon them. Don't be anxious about the things that come up in life, but in everything... How? By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, right? Listen, I, I want to encourage you as you think about praying about things that are come up in your life that make you anxious, pray about those things with a thankful heart. It'll change the way you pray. Oh, Lord, i got to deal with a situation here. I don't want to do it. I'm frustrated, I'm upset. We just hope to go by quick. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here. I think when we go to the Lord in everything by prayer and supplication with thankful hearts, with thanksgiving, and let a request be made known to God, we open the door for God to work in our hearts. If we can come to Him with gratitude, it changes the way we pray. If I could give you just a couple of quick points to work through in this passage. Number one, don't hold on to your anxieties. Don't hold on to them. Right? Isn't that what we do when we don't take them to God in, with prayer, with supplication, with thanksgiving? When we don't let those requests be made known to God, we are unnecessarily hanging on to our own anxieties. Don't hold on to them. And when we do, when we hang on to these, we load ourselves down with unnecessary burdens that we don't need to carry. Number two, thankfully give them to God. Thankfully give them to God. Instead of burden bearing, we're burden casting, if you will. And then notice what happens, the result in verse 7. Don't be anxious. Then everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Boy, is that a beautiful verse. Talk about something that we should read and should just blow our minds. In fact, the idea of the peace of God surpassing all understanding, I want you to catch this. 
you, you can't even begin, it, it, it constantly blows our minds. The grammar of this passage tells us that this surpassing all understanding is something that continually happens. And if you've ever experienced the peace of God, if you ever dealt with anxiety in a scenario where it was really bothering you, you're really troubled, and you really tried to put these verses into practice and give it to God, if you experience the peace of God, it's mind-blowing. And what's even amazing that even as we continually do that again and again and again in our lives, it's still mind-blowing. It still surpasses all understanding each and every time. That's the amazing peace of God that we can experience. And notice what the peace of God does. It guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God's peace guards our, our heart, meaning the emotional component with our feelings, our emotions, and our minds, our perception. Isn't that what we need? Our perception needs to be changed about what's really going on when we're anxious. It, the peace of God guards our hearts. It guards our mind, that perception, our intellect, our disposition. It's all changed. It's all guarded in Christ Jesus. And that's what we need. We've, we've got to have our disposition, our disposition, our minds. We've got to have our thoughts guarded in who we are in Christ. That's where the peace of God comes from. But when we address anxiety with the antidote of continual prayer in this passage, I tell you, it ought to be one that you underline in your Bible because it's something you have to continually do. And when we continually do it, there's continual peace. I've said this many, many times before, but I think it needs to be said once again. You will never experience the peace of God unless you have peace with God. There's a huge difference. We want the peace of God. We want this peace that surpasses all understanding. But unless we have peace with God, meaning a relationship with God, that we've given our lives to Him, and He's the, the leader of our life, forgiver of our sin that we've mentioned many times, where unless we're truly a follower of Christ, this isn't for us. And, and I hate to say that, but that's the truth of it. You, you have, if you want to experience this mind-blowing peace, it will only happen if you give your life to Christ. Well, this is something that God gives really, I think, as a beautiful spiritual blessing to followers of Christ. So as we look at this, number one, don't hold on to your anxieties. Number two, thankfully give them to God. And number three, change the way you think. Get rid of that stinking thinking. Right? Listen to verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. If we're going to remove the anxiety that's been in our minds, that's in our hearts, that's got us all stirred up, when we remove that, we need to replace it with these things in verse 8. We need to remove those anxious thoughts, and then we need to replace those anxious thoughts which, with that which is true, honorable, pure, lovely, lovely, anything that is excellent or worthy of praise. Think about those things. And then notice in verse 9, you have to practice these things. This has got to be something that's continually practiced. And then the peace of God will be with you. This is not like a, well, I tried it once and it didn't work. This is something that has to be done continually, constantly. We have to remind ourselves of the importance of removing the anxious thoughts, of giving them to God, of laying them at His feet, and then replacing those things with thoughts that are excellent and praiseworthy. We have to set our minds on the right things. Proverbs 12, 25 says this, Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. 
true? Absolutely. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. That's why we have to replace and we have to think on these things, Paul says, Philippians 4, 8. And then as we consider the importance of prayer in dealing with anxiety and our thoughts and concerns with the Lord, I, I drove by uh, PCF Church and they had this verse on their, on their um, sign out front, Psalm 102, 17. He regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. Listen, for those of you who are dealing with anxiety, that probably connects with you. You're probably like, you know what? I am the destitute. I'm desperate for God's help. I'm desperate for him to work in my life. I just want to be rid of this. I want to be done with it. I don't want to deal with it. Listen, he regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. About a year and a half ago, Tanner preached a message from Psalm 4610. I want you to listen to this verse. It says this, Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Dealing with anxiety. Anxiety over what the rest of the day is going to bring. Jesus makes it very clear if you're worried about what's coming down the road, Matthew 6, 34, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough trouble in and of itself. Let's just deal with today. But this idea of being still and knowing that he is God has the idea of cease striving. Stop. Let go. Be still and know that I'm God. If we could ju just put it in a, in, a, in a few words, we could say this. Let go and let God. Be still. Stop striving. So what are some of the things that you need to let go of? What are some of the things that cause you to be anxious and cause you to worry? What, what gets you worked up? I'm going to... I'm going to let you know some of the things that I struggle with. In fact, my wife did me the favor. I guess this is a favor. My wife did me the favor of coming up with a list of things that can lead to me becoming anxious. I didn't ask her to do this. But she goes, you know, I've been thinking about your message. I think it'd be good if you would share some of the things that you get anxious about. So I came up with a list for you. Thanks, hon. You know what, in all seriousness, that's a great wife. And you know what, for those of you who are married, listen to your spouse. Listen to what they're trying to tell you. Because they're going to see some things that you don't. Uh, she listed five things. I think it was five. Maybe there was one more and I didn't want to put it on here. <laughs> the first thing she put down was Madison flying. Okay, our, our daughter's making these trips. She's in Europe right now. I don't get, I'm not that guy that's like, oh, the plane's going to crash. I'm not that. It's more like I want to make sure she gets her connections and her flights because I don't want to have to pay for another ticket. All right? That's really more what it's about. And, and uh, so I, I'll go to all the work of trying to figure out, okay, I know she's flying into this terminal, into this gate, and she's got to get to this terminal and this route. And I, I might even watch a YouTube video on what it's like to navigate that airport. So when she gets off, she immediately calls me, and I can talk her through exactly where she needs to go. Maybe, maybe that, okay, all right. It's true. Number two is a busy schedule. Man, life gets busy and I get anxious. I just do. I'm on edge and I catch myself having to stop and take a deep breath. And can I tell you that we joke, you know, that we throw that, hey, just take a deep breath. It is really helpful to do that. Really helpful. Just stop and All right, let's relax. Let's think this through. Disobedient children. I don't think my kids are in this service, so we'll let them off the hook. But she said, disobedient kids make me anxious. Sermon prep. Oh, man, sermon prep makes me anxious. It just does. As I prepare for messages, 
it's, it's something that I just can, can lead me to dealing with anxiety. It's not so much the delivery, it's the preparation, right? Probably Paul and Tanner could tell you about that too. And a lack of exercise and nutrition. It just does. And, and, and we've talked a little bit last week about some things physically, but just the importance of exercise and, and, and nutrition can really even be connected with anxiety. So what are some of the things that lead you to becoming anxious? Not that you need to come up and share those, okay? We won't have you do that. Maybe your spouse is making a list right now. They're quickly scribbling some notes. But maybe that's a great question to ask. Maybe it's a great question to ask the people that are close to you in your life. Maybe it's a good question to ask your coworkers or classmates. What are some of the things that lead to you becoming anxious? And maybe you have some of those things. Maybe, and I just encourage you, maybe you got one or two things in your mind right now of things that cause you to become anxious. What I want to do is I want to read all of Psalm 46. Don't worry, there's only 11 verses. But I want to read Psalm 46 to you. And I want to encourage you to allow the Word of God to flood your heart and your soul with the truth of His Word as you consider the anxious things that are in your life. And if you need to close your eyes, that's fine. If you need to do something to kind of help you kind of focus in on this, really listen to these words. Psalm 46 says this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters His voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come. Come behold the works of the Lord. How He has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. And then the words of the Lord God, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. All God's people said, amen. Listen, that's the power of God's word. And when we deal with struggles and anxieties in life, worries, we need to cease striving. We need to be still. We need to stop. We need to let go and give it to God. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know, in some regard, this is an issue of pride and humility. Anxiety really opens the door for pride. Because a lot of times it's us trying to figure out how we're going to deal with our problems, how we're going to solve them, how we're going to 
get rid of these struggles and as we listen to Psalm 46 and as we consider the words throughout Scripture, there's this reality of be still and recognize who's God. Humble yourselves. 1 Peter chapter 5 says this, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him. For He cares for you. I've used these verses in a lot of different ways. I don't think I've ever read this whole passage together in a message like this before. But I want you to notice the connection. It starts with humility under the mighty hand of God, recognizing, right? Be still. He's the one who's in control. So the proper time, He may exalt you. He'll help us deal with all the anxieties. So cast them. Give them all to Him because He cares for you. And then it comes with a warning. Be sober-minded, right? Be alert, right? Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Let's think about that in the light of anxiety. He's looking to distract us with all the what ifs. So we got to be alert, sober minded, watchful. And then verse 9 goes on to say this resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ, will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To Him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Listen, whether it's discouragement last week that we talked about dealing with discouragement, this week addressing anxiety, we need to allow the Word of God to be poured over our hearts and minds. Husbands, Ephesians chapter 5. I want you to read that and consider washing your wife with the Word. Be in God's Word. Allow it to be poured over you, over your relationships. And allow the Word of God to take root and hold in our life to give us the hope that we need. Last week, we could have boiled down the the message to one one word, and that was hope, to hope in God. This morning, we started about singing, my hope is you. Show me your ways. Guide me in your truth. Not the made-up realities of what we think in our own minds and heart or the what-ifs that we work up. Allow His Word, His truth to flood our hearts and souls. And allow His peace. Once we give those things to Him and lay them at His feet, those anxieties, those struggles... Allow the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Last week, I I closed with reading a verse from Numbers chapter 6 and just asked and just prayed a blessing over our church. And I'm going to do that again this week as I close. So if you'll bow your heads, close your eyes, and listen to these words from the Apostle Paul from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Listen to them and consider them. Now may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. God, we come before you today recognizing that in so many ways we carry around burdens that we don't need to carry, that we can give to You and allow You to pour Your peace into our hearts and lives. God, I I pray for those that really struggle with anxiety. I I pray, Lord, that You just do a great work in their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would just help them to realize the power and authority that comes 
from your word, that comes through the power of prayer. I pray that they would take these passages to heart, that they would memorize them, that they would claim them. And Lord, I pray that your peace would blow their minds. I pray that as they work towards casting all their cares upon you, that they would recognize how much that you care for them. I pray that as, as they are real and open up and share about the burdens that they deal with day in and day out, Lord, that I, I pray that others would come alongside of them as well. Help us to be the body and care for one another just as Paul expressed. God, help us to humble ourselves. Help us to stop, to cease striving, to be still, and recognize the one who is above it all. The one who alone is God, the maker and creator of all things. God, we rest in your care. We rest in the comfort and power and authority of your word in our lives. God, grant us great peace. And God, we will praise you. We will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.